musical saw is completely unlike any other musical instrument. First off, it's literally a saw, like for cutting wood, that has been repurposed to create melodies. Secondly, the physics of how it produces a note is unlike all other instruments. Somehow, even though it is held at its ends in the hands, the saw is able to ring out with a long-lasting, pure tone without becoming muted. How is this possible? By the end of this video, we are going to answer that question and in the process discover the fascinating physics of how materials bend, wave dynamics, and even learn about a technique from quantum mechanics that we can borrow to understand the saw. Let's get started. Musical instruments produce sound by vibrating, which generates sound and allows them to produce music. But when I hold my saw like this and try to get sound out of it, nothing happens. What happened? If we look at a few other examples of common instruments and how they produce sound, we get some hints. They all create vibration confined in a very specifically controlled region. String instruments, for example, have strings that vibrate between two fixed points, designed to hold the string rigidly in place at the desired length and tension. Wind instruments have a tube of a specific length. Pitch percussion, like bells, xylophones, or marimbas, have materials of various sizes to produce a single pitch. Now, if I so much as gently touch the guitar string with my fingers, the vibrations are quickly absorbed, and the sound vanishes. So we have a mystery. How is it that I can create music from a saw that I am holding in my fingers and between my knees? Here's the secret. If I instead hold the saw like this in an S shape, it produces a clear tone. Why does such a slight difference in the shape of the saw unlock the musical note? How does this prevent my body from absorbing the waves? But before we can get to that, we have to understand the physics of what makes elastic materials, like the saw, vibrate, which brings us to one of the first elastic things we learn about in physics, the spring. Springs are simple. You stretch on them one way, and they try to pull you back the other way. The more you stretch, the more force they pull back with. This is known as Hooke's Law. X describes how far we've moved or displaced an object, and F tells us how hard and in what direction the spring pushes in response. A physical material like steel actually stretches just like a spring. In fact, that's because they make springs out of steel. Stretching a steel wire gives a relationship identical to Hooke's Law. The essential difference, though, is that our idealized spring only has two ends, whereas our block of steel is a continuous material, consisting of a continuum of points. Really, a physical material behaves more like this coil, where every point moves independently. This allows one part to stretch one way, while another part stretches the other, creating a wave. The wave you see here is called a standing wave, because rather than traveling in only one direction, the wave is trapped by being securely held fixed on both ends, causing the wave to reflect and reinforce itself. Properly designing these ends, or boundary conditions, is critical to musical instruments so their waves can reinforce themselves without getting absorbed by their surroundings. You've probably heard of Newton's second law of motion, which states that an object accelerates at a rate proportional to the net force being applied to it. As it turns out, there's another very beautiful and elegant approach to physics that almost gives the universe a human personality. It says that the universe is always going to take the path of least resistance in getting from point A to point B. Just like a person might try to minimize the time of their commute to work, physics always tries to minimize something, and this thing is called the action, where L is called the Lagrangian. Imagine that you've never experienced gravity before, and you are guessing the motion of a dropped stone. Your first guess is that the rock drops at a constant speed. So you write down your answer and hand it over to Action, who is an omnipotent judge of physics. She looks at your guess and scores you on how close to the right answer it is, 
where lower is better. You try another guess, and this time you're a little bit better. If you went on refining your guess indefinitely, you would arrive at the actual motion of the drop stone. To put it mathematically, action is a function that maps proposed physical trajectories to real numbers, and the true motion that would happen in the real world is the one that has the minimum action. For the case of the falling stone, the action is the integral of the kinetic energy minus the potential energy through time. To give a sense of the power of solving problems as minimization or maximization problems, a hanging chain assumes a shape with minimum potential energy, the entropy of an isolated system approaches maximum, and the voltages in an electric circuit always find a configuration of minimum power dissipated. This gives us a lens through which to study the mystery around the workings of the saw. To get a feel for how this works, and add insight into our study of the saw, I'll show you the process for a simple example of a mass bouncing on a spring. We are primarily interested in the result to draw analogy with the saw, so don't get too bogged down in the details. First, we write down the Lagrangian, L equals T minus U, and the action, S, is the integral of L dt. T is the kinetic energy, and U is the potential energy. The stiffness of the spring is k. A dot over a variable is its time derivative, or rate of change. A stiff spring takes more energy to excite to the same amplitude than a weak spring, so you can think of k as telling us how much energy it takes to stretch the spring to the desired amplitude. After working out the math, we end up with this equation whose solution is a sine wave. Omega is the frequency and describes how rapidly the spring oscillates. The key takeaway here is the fact that the more potential energy needed to excite the vibration, or to put it another way, the stiffer the spring, the higher the frequency of oscillation will be. Is there a way that we can think of the saw's ability to change pitch with this mindset? To explore this idea, let's visualize the saw so we can do thought experiments. The saw is indeed a 3D material but in many ways it behaves like a 2D surface. Its thickness is much smaller than its width or length. To simplify our lives, let's treat the vibration of the saw by simply tracking its mid-plane. As long as we keep track of how this center plane warps, we can estimate how the rest of the saw warps alongside it. Okay, so in what ways can the saw vibrate? The saw has two fundamentally different types of vibration, and they are easy to visualize. The first type doesn't actually change the shape of the surface at all, because it only involves motion along the surface of the saw. This includes expansion and contraction of the saw along its length or width, and shearing motion in this plane. We will call this type of motion in-plane, or in-surface motion. This type of distortion costs energy because we are stretching and compressing the material in various directions, just like stretching the simple one-dimensional spring. The second type is just good old run-of-the-mill bending, where the surface of the saw moves perpendicular to, or in and out from its surface. We will call this type of motion normal motion, because the motion is normal or perpendicular to the surface. Bending also costs energy, but in an interesting way. It's because of the thickness of the sheet. Curvature tends to make the sheet compress on the inside of a curve and expand on the outside, both of which cost energy. These two kinds of motion are very different from each other and seem unrelated. After all, moving a tiny amount in the normal direction doesn't immediately pull or push its neighbors side to side at all. And indeed, the math for a flat sheet confirms that these two waves are totally decoupled from each other, which just means that you could have normal motion on its own, or you could have in-plane motion on its own, and these two kinds of vibration don't interact or bother each other in any way. But when we curve the sheet, all of this changes. 
and the waves couple. Why should this be? Imagine for a moment that our sheet has constant curvature, and we want to introduce some normal motion without any in-surface motion. To put it another way, that means that the surface of the saw moves only radially in and out. As you can see, even though the motion is purely perpendicular to the surface, it clearly results in compression and extension in the saw due to the curved geometry. This means that even a pure normal displacement actually gives rise to extensional motion and therefore costs not only the usual energy due to bending, but also a new energy due to this stretching motion. Nature sees this opportunity to minimize the potential energy by adding some in-surface motion in addition to the compression caused by normal motion. Physics can avoid any additional stretching by just rolling up the slack, as you see here. This means that even when we use the bow to excite normal motion on a curved saw, we can't help but also generate in-surface motion. Since both of these kinds of waves play a role in the potential energy, changing which kind and how much of each we have can have a big impact on the frequency or pitch of the sound we hear from the saw. That's why the normal and in-surface waves on a curved saw interact, which is the first clue that gives the saw its magical ability to change pitch when curved. To understand the pitch, or frequency dependence, of the saw with curvature, we need to understand how much potential energy is needed to make the vibration. But due to nature's obsession with minimization, it is able to completely avoid stretching by redistributing the slack. Since this doesn't change the wave's potential energy on a curved saw, the frequency doesn't change either. And so the mystery of the singing saw continues. Let's look at the saw in the real world to get a hint and identify the missing piece to this puzzle. When a surface vibrates as a standing wave, there are regions that vibrate, called antinodes, partitioned by curves or lines where there is no vibration, called nodal lines. What's really cool is that I can visualize these nodes in real life by dropping some salt on the surface of the saw. Regions that vibrate up and down will knock the particles around until they eventually find their way to the nodal lines, where there is no vibration, and finally settle down, creating distinct lines representing the location of the nodes. Can you make a prediction about the resulting pattern when I scatter salt on the saw's surface and play a note? Let's try it. Wow! We see two very clear lines going down the length of the saw, which is definitely not what I expected. Something else weird. While I can clearly see the lines in the middle of the saw's length, the salt up here, close to the ends of the saw, remains spread out, and haven't been focused down by the vibration. In fact, it looks like these areas weren't even vibrating at all. For some reason, the wave stays totally localized to the center of the length of the saw. This demonstrates our expectation that the saw, just like practically any other instrument, also confines the wave to a region, but in a very different way from the other instruments that give the vibrating area a sharp edge to bounce off of, like the bridge on a guitar or the circumference of a cymbal. In this experiment, you can see something really wild. The wave seems to be trapped within this area by something seemingly invisible. We made two surprising discoveries in this experiment. First, the two nodal lines running down the length of the saw clearly indicate that the sound we hear comes from a mode that is also bending along this direction, like this. Second, we saw that the wave is mysteriously trapped near the middle of the saw, which we will unpack in the next section. Now that we know that the saw also bends this way, let's revisit our thought experiment. 
What does this bending wave look like on a saw that is already bent? Well, here's our initial bend that the musician puts into the saw. And now let's add a small amount of bending wave motion, purely in the short direction. You can see that now the surface of the saw alternates between a bowl and saddle shape. Previously, we saw that nature was able to completely adjust the in-surface motion to correct for the stretching introduced by the normal motion. But how about now? If you were nature, and you could decide how to shift the surface of the sheet around, can you find a way to totally avoid the stretching while the surface bends from a bowl shape to a saddle? The answer is a resounding no. Not because it's too complex to come up with a way, but because it is mathematically impossible. A bowl cannot be turned into a saddle without any stretching or shearing of the material. And the reason is simple. The curvature of a bowl is positive, while the curvature of a saddle is negative, and a result proved by Gauss in 1827, called the Theorema Egregium, states that the curvature of a surface cannot change under local isometries, which, simply put, means no stretching or shearing of any kind is allowed. This is also why it's easier to eat a pizza when you bend it into a slight curve to keep it from sagging. Okay, cool. So no matter what nature decides to do with the in-surface motion, the presence of our wave, as long as it has curvature in the short direction, necessitates an increased potential energy. And this increase causes the frequency or audible pitch of the saw to increase too. This explains why the frequency depends on saw curvature. But we still don't understand why we can hear it in the first place. What stops the wave from reaching the ends of the saw, where it would be quickly absorbed by the player's hands, and totally mute the note? In our thought experiment, we imagined a wave that only wiggled along the short axis of the saw. But there can also be wiggling in the long direction, and this plays a role for the frequency as well. Just like the frequency omega counts how many oscillations there are within some time window, the time density of waves, if you will, we can do the same thing to count the number of oscillations in a spatial window, too. Appropriately, this is called the wave number, and it is denoted k. k represents the space density of waves, so it's inversely proportional to the wavelength. Omega and k allow us to understand the properties of a wave. For example, when I make a sound, Waves travel outward in all directions through the air. As I increase the frequency, you can see that the distance between the waves decreases, or equivalently, their density, k, increases in a proportional manner to omega. Their proportionality is determined by the speed of the sound wave in air, v, since a wave traveling at a higher speed with the same wavelength is perceived as a higher frequency. For sound waves in air, this can be summed up in the following equation. Omega equals V times K. While sound waves happen to have this linear relationship in air, this is not always the case for waves in general. In general, the speed of a wave could actually depend on its frequency, meaning that high and low frequencies would travel at different speeds, causing them to disperse as they travel. Appropriately, the relationship between omega and k is called the dispersion relation and is very useful in understanding wave mechanics. So what does the dispersion relation look like for our saw? When we started our exploration of the saw, we intuited that modes with no short axis variation, nature can always adjust the in-service motion to avoid any extension whatsoever even as we start to manually bend the saw. Consequently, no increase in frequency occurs. Higher wave number costs more energy. These modes have a dispersion that looks like this. But these aren't the modes that we hear when I play the saw. The ones with the two nodal lines we saw in our experiment are. Their extra bending along Y always requires additional energy, 
even when k equals zero, which causes the dispersion to shift upwards like this. This is interesting, since it means that the curve never gets lower than this frequency here. So this is the lowest note I could possibly play on the saw. Any note lower than this is forbidden on the saw. Okay, now what do you think happens for this dispersion relation as we increase the curvature of the saw? We argue that the pitch for modes with k equals zero rises as the curvature increases. So we expect the curve at k equals zero to rise. Okay, here's what happens. Just as we expected, the frequency rises for k equals zero and smallish k, and eventually approaches the unbent saw dispersion for higher k, when the wavelength gets small enough to not notice the curvature anymore. The effect is so strong for small k that it even causes the dispersion relation to become not strictly increasing for large curvatures. The main takeaway here is that increasing the curvature of the saw causes the forbidden frequency range to grow, making it so that more and more modes with higher and higher frequency are banished from the saw. And therein lies the magic. It's precisely this banishment that results in the dead zones we saw in our experiment with the salt on the saw. Let's break down what's happening here. When I play the saw, I'm actually creating an S shape in the blade like this. If we look in the middle of the S, the saw is totally flat, so the curvature kappa is zero. As we move away from the center, the curvature increases. This means that the wave in the middle of the saw follows a different dispersion relation from the wave closer to the ends of the saw. So the same omega and k that were compatible in the center won't be anywhere else. Since the whole saw vibrates at the same frequency omega, k is forced to adjust to respect the changing dispersion relation. Imagine that we want to excite a wave at a given frequency. We can figure out its wave number at the center of the S simply by looking up the corresponding k on the dispersion relation for the center of the saw like this. Now what happens as the wave moves to the right and enters an increasingly larger curvature? Well, the dispersion relation changes under the wave's feet, and its wave number has to adjust accordingly. As you can see, the wave is forced to decrease k, causing it to stretch out or increase its wavelength. This process continues until the curvature gets to the point where our given frequency is no longer permitted which occurs right here. Since the wave cannot exist any farther to the right, it is no choice but to turn around, heading back toward lower curvature. The wave has reflected off of nothing. As it does so, its wave number starts to increase again until it gets back to the center and continues to the opposite side of the saw and gets reflected in the same way from the opposite end. Just like other instruments, like the guitar, the wave is forced to reflect to create a standing wave. The only difference is that the saw achieves this not by a reflection off of a sharp edge, but instead from a slowly varying curvature of the saw that creates an invisible, uninhabitable boundary that the wave cannot penetrate. And here lies the answer to our mystery of why the musician's hands don't immediately mute the note. The wave reflects before reaching the ends of the saw, like the guitar, the frequency of the vibration is determined by the dispersion relation and how wide the habitable region of the wave is, which together determine how many wavelengths can fit in. This intuitive idea of treating wave dynamics through a medium with a slowly varying property, like curvature in our example, and using the dispersion relation at every point is actually incredibly useful since it enables physicists and mathematicians to estimate solutions to differential equations, even when no exact solution can be written down in terms of standard functions. This technique, called the WKB approximation, is used extensively all over physics. Studying the musical saw raised so many interesting questions whose answers pushed us to learn quite a lot. To recap, 
let's review the main takeaways. We saw that musical instruments all can find their vibrations to a localized space, and the saw does this invisibly, without sharp boundaries. We saw that materials such as the metal sheet of the saw behave just like a continuum of springs in three dimensions. Then, we explored Lagrangian mechanics, which taught us that the physical universe is lazy and always finds the path of least resistance, which can be used to do physics instead of using Newton's laws. We then returned to understand the motion of the saw and realized that bending, stretching, and shearing all play a role in this musical story. Doing some experimentation with salt, we discovered that the saw has two nodes running down its length when played, which enabled us to intuit that its vibrations must cause additional shearing and stretching as the saw is bent by the player, which led us to understand the concept of the dispersion relation. And with this knowledge, we explained how the wavelength adjusts as it travels through areas of varying curvature, and how this concept is the foundation of the WKB approximation. And then finally, we saw that the wave on the saw would be trapped, unable to venture into the part of the saw where the curvature is too great, which explained why the sound never got absorbed into my hands and also explained why its pitch rises when the saw is bent into a tighter S shape.